thanks for listening to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in American soccer. And don't forget to subscribe. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast. I'm Stephen Jodder, and joining me is the one and only Armand Kafai. How we doing, Armand? We're doing good, man. It's game that think of the semester, but what can I say? I'm doing well, and soccer is starting back up, and I'm excited. I'm excited, man. Absolutely. We got a fantastic episode. The COO of the New York Cosmo, we've had him on before, Eric Stover joins us. And then I spoke with Matt Beasler, Sporting KC defender. So you'll hear both of their voices on today's show. But before we get to any of that, Armand, we have a special announcement. But this Ooh. special announcement will come next week. So you got right, to see. You're, you're, you're giving cliffhangers to people now? Like, come on. Like, come I have on. To. But yeah. next week, we got a very special announcement that you listeners will want to absolutely know about because we're giving away something so find out what yes but armand before we get to stover the ussf election finished up we've had a week to marinate on what happened what are your overall thoughts on it man you put me on the spot with these overall thoughts i like it i like it but Steven, to be quite honest with you, I'm not surprised. I mean, I, I tweeted this out. If anyone was surprised, you've just been reading Twitter. You haven't been reading anything else, and you don't know what's going on. I, there was no surprise. I think people were hoping to be surprised, but there is no surprise. Carlos Codero winning it, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, when we're going when they're going through the election, you saw it was 30, 30, and then you saw the rest of the candidates get like 10, 10, like 1, 4%, 0%. 0. You know there was you knew there was no chance at at that point and yeah it was it was not the best the but go ahead good I was the only thing I'm a little bit surprised is why did Kathy Carter run in the first place hmm it's a good question I'm not sure because because I, I don't, you're right I, I just didn't feel like she wanted the job yeah no, I, I just, agree. And it's not a disrespect to her and and her association with some. She did a wonderful job over there. Obviously, she's, she's still doing a wonderful job. I mean, look how much money some has made. I mean, she is an an outstanding businesswoman. I just don't think she wanted the the presidency. I, I just I just I feel like she I mean, who can blame her, man? I, I exactly. I wouldn't, I, mean, want I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't want it. Plain and simple. And if it's if the things are as it says, an unpaid position. You're coming in as basically like a glorified volunteer. Uh, you have to, you know, deal with all these issues. You just missed the World Cup, which is probably the most colossal failure in U.S. soccer history. Right. And you have to deal with all that on an unpaid basis? No, I, I, I agree. But it is what it is. Listeners, tell us what your thoughts are. Tweet us at Unc Sam Soccer Pod. Tell us why you think Kathy Carter ran. And what were your overall thoughts on the election? But up next... It's the one and only Eric Stover. Join us back on the show. A guest of ours previously, it's the man, Eric Stover, CEO, COO of the New York Cosmos. Eric, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Doing really good. Um, but it's been about a week since the one of the biggest events in U.S. soccer this year, which happened last week, so early in the year. Obviously, the USSF soccer election. Carlos Cordero, after three rounds, was, a local, uh, was elected president. Uh, what are your thoughts on his election? Um, well, I think in, in hindsight, um, it was inevitable, um, you know, just the way the delegates and the, the weighted voting works. Um, I think it was a, a huge mountain to climb for any outsider to win. It, 
it's kind of funny to talk about Kyle Martino or Hope Solo or mm-hmm. Eric Winalda as outsiders, but um, really the only chance I think was if that group of six candidates had really become one with one unified voice, then maybe there was a chance, but just the way the way the delegates work and the weighted system, um, it was almost um, a foregone conclusion. Uh, I had thought Kathy Carter was going to win, but I think what what changed that analysis was the athlete council, which gets twenty percent of the vote voting as a block, and that twenty percent going to Carlos Cordero um, changed everything. Um, had it gone to Kathy. Um, she would have won in the first first round. Um, and then you know, with with Carlos, he had a bit of a lead, and second second round through, he he had an even bigger lead, and it became obvious, I think, to folks at MLS that uh, uh, they needed to get behind uh, Carlos's uh, direction, and they threw their votes that way, and we have a new president now. Were you surprised when the group of six didn't combine or, I guess, throw support towards one after the first round? Um, well, I, to be fair, there was a lot of discussion leading up to the election. And, you know, I'm right. not a, I wasn't directly involved, uh, but I heard uh, from the for the six participants you know, in the fallout the next day, you know, leading up to the election, um, you know, sort of the details behind that. And I think there was analysis bef- before the election that they do, they did need to come together, that they weren't going to independently be able to carry the day. Uh, I think some folks pay too much attention to polls. Um, even though many people understood that polls meant nothing in this, since they weren't polling the delegates, they were mm-hmm. polling fans. Mm-hmm. So you could just throw all that out. It was just garbage data. But some people, I think, believed in, in that a little bit. They believed in the, the chance that, you know, the the far um, extreme change candidates were going to fall off and that the status quo would fall off and maybe they'd be left standing like a, Abraham Lincoln's election, and um, and that it, it was foolish analysis, uh, definitely in hindsight, because it's a weighted system. And if you add up what Don Garber himself or MLS could pull together, you've got the MLS's percentage, which I think was like fourteen, fifteen percent. They had a, a lot of influence over the NWSL because they have owners that own those teams. The USL with that relationship. Uh, the, the votes that they have through adult council and the influence over the athlete council, that there was really no way an outsider was going to overcome that, the, the weighted system. And so you couldn't possibly wait for votes to, to flip-flop. So I, the, this is a long way of getting to your, your question, which is, yeah, they, they, they met, they, they spoke about it. A lot of stuff I saw reported was completely inaccurate, and I heard it verified from four different candidates mm. what really happened in that room. Um, and so it's unfortunate the way things went down and fingers were pointed in unfair directions. But, you know, it's, it was a messy election, and I guess those kinds of things are going to happen. Do you mind elaborating on what happened in that room when the candidates got together? Uh, well, the way it was explained to me was they weren't necessarily all together at the same time. Maybe at, at points they were, um, but they were working on a message of support of each other and the idea of either dropping out before the election starts or what's the process of dropping out. Um, and there were more extreme viewpoints um, and more conservative viewpoints and, you know, what went in the language. And there was a lot of um, frustration between um, different candidates. The idea that Eric Winalda uh, sabotaged the whole thing was completely not true. And I heard that from candidates not named Eric Winalda. So, um, you know, why it came out like that, uh, why there were journalists in the room, during conversations 
and and how things respond i i don't know but again it, you know, people and this is was the fundamental problem of the change movement was you had egos and points of view that simply were not aligned uh never could get aligned uh but that was the only chance they had of winning had they all come together right. rallied around one candidate and i don't know who that would have been because I think because of the personalities, um, it was probably impossible. But let's just say everybody rallied around Kyle Martino as, as an example. Um, he would have come in around 30% on the first go-around, maybe even a little higher if people had responded positively to that kind of uh, move by the group. And if there, if you're at roughly a third and you've got – Carter and uh, Cordero at a third, then then you could possibly see that the athlete council may swing towards a change candidate like Kyle, uh, because as I understand that, the, there were a lot of voices within the athlete council that that were pulling for a former player and not an administrator. So, um, in that block, that weighted block of twenty percent. Um, in this particular election, really decided everything. So if a change candidate could have gotten it, that block of 20% towards them, then then they could have inched over the line. Uh, but, you know, that's all hindsight. That's a, a very narrow path that if uh, you had more, everybody had more experience with, they would have recognized. Um, I think, they, you know, people were applying... Um, old math to new math, and it, it just didn't work out. So now that the election is just all done and dusted, Carlos Codero is the president of U.S. Soccer, and I had called him on a preview show a, I guess, kind of change guy, kind of status quo guy, kind of like a like a good drink for those who are voting, and I think that's why uh, me and Steven thought that he was going to win the election prior uh, mm-hmm. to it happening. But do you see... Any sort of change uh, coming? Uh, I know he mentioned he wants to bring a general manager for both the women's and the men's side and delegating the soccer duties to them. But I mean, outside of that, do you think there'll be? Do you think it'll be more change or more similar to uh, how Gulati ran the USSF? Um, I you know it sounds like a cop out, cop out, but we're going to have to wait and see. Mm-hmm. I do think. Uh, technical directors or GMs responsible for the men's and women's team is critical. Uh, some greater attention to the day-to-day, um, you know, real soccer issues is essential. Um, you know, we we've had a lot of problems over the last few years on the men's side. It's not that we didn't qualify for this World Cup, which is massive, but we didn't qualify for the last two Olympics either, and. In that case, you've got young players, for the most part, many of them that are still amateurs that lose out on very, very critical developmental opportunities. Um, so this has been going on for years on the men's side. On the women's side, I think you've got to worry that the rest of the world is starting to catch up, that uh, Title IX and our culture helped uh, women's soccer get way ahead of the curve. Um, but that's not the case anymore, and I hope uh, that there's a technical director on the women's side that's pay- that will pay greater attention uh, to developmental issues that they need because, you know, again, we just had this advantage of culturally and with Title IX that w- women had opportunities. Um, that, but there isn't the structure that they need on, on the women's and girls' side particularly on the girl side, you know, we've got a developmental cap- academy for the boys, but, you know, how much money is going into the girl side? It's almost all pay to play. At least on the boys side, you've got uh, MLS teams that, that are in the DA that don't charge. So um, I think on the girl side, there's a lot of risk, but really what matters um, for, for Carlos and from my opinion as a putting on a completely objective hat that, He's going to address the conflicts of interest with Soccer United Marketing in U.S. soccer. I, there's no doubt that when it was started in the early 2000s, that without the assistance of the Federation and, that, and those broadcast rights, um, 
being bundled with MLS, that MLS probably would have folded. I think some was absolutely critical in saving the league, um, in bringing greater uh, opportunity to MLS owners, greater value. Um, it's really built itself into a great business, um, and it's a big part of the franchise valuation for MLS teams. So in that case, it succeeded. But it also has led to, to conflicts, and, and you can't objectively analyze that and say that that's not, that's not true. Um, and Carlos has publicly stated that, and it was a big part of his response to the Athletes' Council. Now, the reason I say let's wait and see is he's got to follow through on that. What's he going to do with it um, moving forward so it's fair for everybody else trying to develop second, third, fourth division teams in this country? Because at the moment, it's it's almost impossible to make money on the second division level. And I, I attribute a lot of that to the consolidation of control through some. And that actually is a perfect segue into what I was uh, planning on asking. Where do the lower leagues, such as you mentioned the second, third, fourth divisions, where do they go from here uh, after the election? I don't know. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, obviously, the NASL has lawsuits that are, that are out there that have to be uh, run through the courts where the NASL is waiting on a, an appeal uh, to the preliminary injunction. And so everybody understands uh, preliminary injunction isn't really you know, into the, the meat of, of the claims. It's really a short-term stopgap that, allow, that would allow the NASL to continue with second division sanctioning. It is not a, an analysis of the facts. Um, that's going to take a long time, probably 18 months to two years to get through the process. Um, and, and so some people I see, at least on Twitter, are treating that as if there's a victory there for, or a loss for either side. That's, you know, there's, there's tactical advantages, um, if, depending on which way it goes, but really there's a lot that's got to be discussed. Um, and I think the, the claims that NASL makes goes to a lot of the heart of the business of, the sport in this country, Um, the transfer market, solidarity payments, um, television money, just, uh, you know, what markets, tampering in other markets, uh, no promotion or relegation and and the inevitable chaos that that creates. Um, These lawsuits go to all that, and all of those are critical to your financial viability as a second or third division team. Eric, you just spoke of promotion and relegation. Is that something that y'all discuss continuously among, say, within the league of NESL or even with USL? Uh, to my knowledge, there's never been a conversation between the NESL and USL about a promotion and relegation, to my knowledge. But it wouldn't be the, the kind of thing I would handle. Um, there's been discussion, and everybody would love to see it, and despite what some people think, again, on Twitter, uh, there's not really anybody in the NASL that's saying, well, the Cosmos won the uh, NASL in 2015, so we should have been promoted. Um, we know that there's a lot of work that's got to be done in our pyramid to make promotion and relegation, the going down, feasible. And that, in my opinion, is is years of planning and preparation. Um, you can't have teams playing in high school f- uh, football stadiums with football lines playing in the first division. Um, so there's a lot of infrastructure that's got to be worked on. Uh, I think all of, if you could wave a magic wand, promotion or relegation would, would start to address all the things I discussed before revenue generation, uh, the transfer market, TV interest, attendance, everything would be impacted positively with promotion and relegation, in my opinion. Uh, The thing that wouldn't be is franchise valuation in MLS. Um, But I I also see those issues as all independent 
um, challenges that have to be addressed. And if you can address all of those things in a way that leads to promotion and relegation, then I think the sport will be better off. You, you talked about stadiums and infrastructure to the sport. Is the stadium aspect the most important when it comes to infrastructure? Uh, in many in many ways, it is. Um, the, particularly this sport in this country, I think. It, well, really, any any team um, in professional sports, they want their own venue. Um, it's one of the economic engines of a of a team. Uh, so you see the cycle of how things work in the United States for all sports. Many arenas and stadiums are turned down, torn down after 20 to 30 years um, because the business has changed and you've got to get more money out of the building. Um, so that's one thing that MLS has excelled at. The last 10 years in particular, um, the, the picture of an MLS game in Red Bull Arena or in Kansas City, or the new stadium in L.A., or Orlando, that is dramatically better than it was 10, 15 years ago. Mm. Um, and, and that's absolutely essential. You get higher naming rights for venues like that. Your value per seat goes up. There's clubs. There, um, there's premium. Uh, the sponsorship value uh, for your secondary, tertiary sponsors is significantly higher when you're delivering that first class game day experience. So it's absolutely essential. And then when you roll it down to second, third division, you look at the venues that many teams are playing in, it's not even close to professional. Uh, or if it's professional, it's for us, for example, we're playing in a minor league baseball stadium. So, uh, I, you know, the idea of smaller, more market appropriate, uh, but soccer-specific stadiums that are scalable is an essential issue for helping second division move forward. Um, and it, to, to date, hasn't really been addressed that effectively except for in a handful of examples. And just out of curiosity, Eric, which uh, stadium slash venues do you think are the most, uh, I guess you could say, MLS-ready, quote-unquote, uh, in terms of infrastructure? Uh, within the second and third divisions. Second and third division. Well, definitely yeah. San Antonio. Um, they did a nice job. That that building there is like four or five years old. That feels like a League One stadium in England. Um, and it's scalable. There's land there uh, in it. You can build on top of that and ter- take it from, I think it's like nine or 10,000, to 15,000 to 20,000 relatively easy easy relatively affordably um and so i think that's probably the best example um you know most everything else that i can think of is a compromise in some form or fashion whether it's the playing surface uh whether it's the you know a track around the field uh there are some great examples cincinnati obviously is packing them in every week, but that's a college football stadium. That's not um, something that's a a good long-term plan for that organization. They eventually have to have their own building, Um, and I'm sure if they get expansion into MLS, they'll get their own. Um, But at the moment, you know, we're, as a country, we're adapting abandoned minor league baseball stadiums or partnering with existing minor league baseball stadiums. And I I would love to see more purpose built five to 10,000 seat stadiums that uh, markets can grow with. And, you know, you can imagine a time where Detroit city is, you know, doing the five to 10,000 a game, they get promoted up through merit on the field and they're in a venue that could be expanded to 15 or so. And, you know, that, that's a great story. It does, the size of the stadium, if you have 25,000 seats in Dallas and only 5,000 people are going, it, that doesn't mean anything to the quality of the, the club. So marrying those, those uh, pro, pro, professional league standards to the reality of this country, I think is something that's got to get done better. Eric, is, there's there's some sort of risk behind that. I mean, we saw that uh, 
Well, obviously, you know that. We saw that in Rochester with the Rhinos. I mean, they made a stadium because they thought they were going to get into MLS, and then they didn't, so to scale back the plans, and now it's vacant. So how would you, I guess, try to tell teams that, hey, it's, it's it's kind of it's a maybe not as risky of, as an investment as you think if they point to like the Rochester Rhino example in terms of uh, investing in infrastructure. Right. So it's a really good example, and you know the pro rel guys would be <laughs> screaming into the phone. Right now about, <laughs> well, if there was promotion; they could have earned their way up, and it would have been a good invent- uh, right. investment. Um, and and there's merit to that argument as well, but I think it, it's got to be. If you're a second division team, you have to be responsible um, and 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 grow with the sport. So the the Cosmos are probably one of the worst examples of that. We were really aggressive five years ago. Our owner at the time, Seamus O'Brien, had a vision. Um, it wasn't necessarily about promotion and relegation, while, but he did care about that. It was more about um, building the best stadium in the United States in the New York market, um, putting the best team on the field in the New York market and building out a television network. It was super ambitious and would have cost uh, half a billion to a billion dollars over time. And at the end of the day, we were we were undercapitalized and weren't able to pull it off. Uh, so it could have happened, uh, but it didn't. So now that, that that has come and gone, I think the the more prudent approach is is looking at modular stadiums in an area that you can you can grow in, and also diversifying your investment. So whether it's um, having partners with businesses that that make sense, sponsors that make sense, that are interested in helping you grow, or it's a real estate transaction, or you're running uh, youth soccer programs because you have the land or it's a real estate development. There's a lot of uh, old stadiums in England where they have, you know, the north, south, east, west stands, and then it's not one continuous stadium. And they filled in the corners with apartment buildings and hotels and things. And so it became the real estate became almost as important as the team on the field. So I think diversification is, is really important. But what has changed and changed significantly in the last 10 years is you can build a modular stadium for four or five million dollars that would serve your needs right away as, as they're doing in Phoenix and could be something that you could grow as you transition into a bigger club without you know, writing a $200 million check. Eric, there's been quite a bit of a discussion on the future of NESL. Where are we at with that discussion? To be honest, I, I don't know as of this moment right now. Obviously, as we discussed before, the, the court cases are, are critical. Um, and you know the, the current owners and the potential expansion teams have to get on the same page with what the future might look like. And that's really challenging, particularly when you step back and say, well, how do I make money in this in in lower division? What's the future look like? And you know, for us, like the Cosmos, we we have an owner that just loves the game, and and I think understands that it's unlikely that it'll make money, but it also can't be just the abyss of losses. There's got to be a way to to get things under the control financially, um, and so I think. The the potential expansion teams and the existing owners need to get on the same page, understand what the the league should look like, how it should be structured, and how it goes forward. And I know those conversations are ongoing, they're active. Uh, Just right now, uh, at the moment, I don't know what it'll be come August. So... How important is the Cosmos to that New York soccer scene? Obviously, you had NYCFC come in a couple of years ago, and then the Red Bulls, who have been there since, or they were at the Metro Stars, and then they they changed their names to the Red Bulls, but they've been there since MLS has been created. Right. 
Well, I, you know, I've been on both sides of this. So right. I was the managing director at the at the Red Bulls for a few years, um, and also um, I managed Shine Stadium, and and that's really how I fell in love with the sport while I was at Giant Stadium it was the Metro Stars. We had, you know, 15, 20 games a year. Um, and we started to, to do a lot of major international games. Um, but at the time, so I, I didn't know really anything about the Cosmos having grown up in rural Pennsylvania. I start working at Giant Stadium and I'm hearing all these, these stories about Pelé and Mick Jagger and um, Canalia and Beckenbauer and, you know, parties in the stadium club and Studio 54. And this is from all my mentors who <laughs> lived it and, and partied alongside those guys and gals. Um, so I, you know, became more in tune with the sport. We started doing major, major club games. Um, Manchester United against Roma, I think it was. We sold 30 thousand tickets the day of the game almost sold out the stadium and I, I really started to understand the the sport and um you know i heard all those cosmo stories and then eventually a few years down the road i end up at at red bull and what i would hear a lot from fans was you'll never be the cosmos you'll never be the cosmos um and you know it was a cross the bear for the Metro Stars slash Red Bulls, and I think probably still is for them. Um, and, you know, I think we've done a lot as the new Cosmos the last five years. We've um, done some very compelling things internationally, and, of course, we've gone head-to-head, toe-to-toe with the NYCFC and Red Bull, and it's meant a lot to soccer fans. Um, it, the one thing I'd say is I was hoping that the soccer market would have grown more over the last five years, that... Uh, fans would have been more supportive and more uh, loyal to those clubs. And, and, of course, there are examples of, you know, people that are really passionate about it. Um, but, the you know, the attendance struggles for all three teams are, are real. Um, I think the numbers were down pretty significantly, at least from what I could tell, watching games on TV with NYCFC. Our issues have been well documented. Um Red Bull tends to go through spikes and dips. Um, and I would have hoped by now, after five years of these teams really competing, that things would have been more consistent for everybody. But it's a really saturated market. It's uh, There's a lot to do, and it, all the kids play soccer, so um, they're often burned out come 7 o'clock on a Saturday night. Uh, but I do think having an independent club in New York is really, really important, and I hope we can keep it going. What was the craziest thing that you heard about the Cosmos? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've spent a lot of time with Shep Messing, and he's got some stories. Um, let me think. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> um you know, it's it's got to be the the Studio Fifty Four stuff, and and not you know the sex, drugs, and rock and roll stuff. That time in New York City, that was probably the most popular team and the most popular athletes, and that includes the New York Giants, the New York Yankees. It was a phenomenon, um, and it was the right group of guys at the right time where that New York party scene was was real. And you had global superstars, and New York is so cosmopolitan. It just, it all came together mm. so perfectly. Um, and you know, the the evidence is there. I I, got, I had pictures in my office of the opening couple weeks of Giant Stadium in '77 for a Giants game, and it it wasn't sold out. But there were Cosmos games that year that that outdrew the Giants, and and the Yankees were averaging. In the late 70s, probably 25,000 people, 30,000 people a game. I mean, it's a really, really compelling story in a unique time in the city. Why? This is something I've always wondered. Why ha- didn't, say, the Cosmos try to get an expansion bid years ago, obviously maybe even before NYCFC, but try to be that second New York club in MLS? Well, that was a, a previous ownership group. I think they took it very seriously and looked at it closely. 
um, to be honest, they, they couldn't justify the $100 million expansion tag, especially with the challenges of building a stadium in the city. And I and when Seamus O'Brien came in, he had a different plan, which I've already outlined. He had, uh, you know, the the idea of bringing the Cosmos back to the level they were in the '70s, in the late '70s, and he didn't think you could do that within the single entity structure in MLS. And you know, so for NYCFC, I think City Football Group is probably the only investor that would have made that decision. Um, you know, five years ago to invest in MLS. From what I heard, uh, the folks from Qatar that own PSG had backed away. Um, and, you know, I think for City Football Group and what they're about, it's not necessarily the soccer on the field. There's a lot of other things. It's, you know, they're ultimately part of the royal family of Abu Dhabi and they have, they want to diversify their investments beyond oil and energy. Um, and sort of change the reputation of the UAE globally. Um, so for those reasons, um, they decided to make the decision, and they've done that in Australia and other places. Um, but you know now they struggle with their, their stadium challenges, and it's a not an easy thing to do. And if they ever get it done, it's probably going to cost Six hundred million dollars, which is three times what Red Bull Arena costs, and um, for people looking to make money on the sport, um, you can't do that. But we'll see. We'll see what they're able to pull off. And um, like I said, they have. It's not just ROI for City Football Group, so I think it, it made sense for them. So, do you see uh, NYCFC just staying in uh, Yankee Stadium for the foreseeable future? Uh, well, there's nowhere else to go, and right. I've been in this market a long time and <laughs> been everywhere, um, and so <laughs> there is nowhere else to go. Um, and to get from concept to ribbon cutting is probably eight years, uh, so I think they're going to be at Yankee Stadium. It could be done faster, but I think in this country, on average, from from concept to ribbon cutting, it's eight years. Um, so I'd be very, very surprised, um, if it happens faster than that, but it can, um, I think from what I hear, they've got two or three options, um, depending, and they have a lot of very influential people within their organization, um, that can move mountains within New York city. Um, so possibly could be done within five years. Um, but I think it probably takes longer than that. I, and I want to transition to another part of the game, the women's game, which you actually recently tweeted about when you uh, quote tweeted an article. And you said it's a real issue. While they're far from perfect, the U.S. has led the way in more equitable sporting systems for women, especially soccer. The rest of the world is still catching up, no doubt. And that's something that I have hammered and Stephen have hammered multiple times, that while our team is really good right now, it seems like there's been a lot more investments going on and people are starting to take notice, starting to invest more and more in the women's game. And I was on Twitter and I saw the Utah Royals, which used to be the Kansas City team, uh, which were own, owned by the same people who own the RSL. Uh, they were showing off the locker room. They were giving cars to the players. They were fully giving fully furnished apartments. And it, it, it kind of seemed like a little change was uh, going on within women's soccer. But I want to ask you, outside of uh, – Equality in terms of pay, which I think should happen, it's given almost. What improvements uh, need to be made uh, in terms of the women's game? Well, I, I think the risk that the women's game has right now is, um, in England in particular, the big clubs are investing in, in women's soccer. Um, and so they're, they're attracting the best players from around the world because they already have the infrastructure there. Um, the the owners have deep pockets and, and couldn't afford to lose money on women's soccer in the short term, um, and and that type of investment, which women's soccer has never really had, um, there's never been a a real proper pro league that can compete internationally with what they're paying um, consistently. Whenever it's been tried, it's it's ultimately faltered and failed. 
the NWSL has been around for a little while now, but they're still on, on shaky ground, and what the players are getting paid pales in comparison to opportunities they have internationally. Um, so I think that risk is very real. I think a lot of the world is caught up to um, equality, not just in pay, certainly probably have it, nobody's caught up in pay, I think maybe Norway pays men's and women's national team players the same. But other than that, there's a long way to go. But they're at least giving uh, greater opportunities. I think what's happened in the United States is it was part of our culture in, in Title IX with college sports. Um, it gave a real pathway for girls to play the game, keep playing the game, come up through high school, um, you know, participate in, in clubs and academies, get a college scholarship, you know, that whole uh, infrastructure that naturally exists in this country was good enough to make us the best in the world. We're now going to start competing with countries that have uh, billionaires invested in, in soccer, football, um, that are building, building out academies where the, where the kids aren't having to pay to play and, you know, they're treating it very much like they would the men's team. So I think uh, as this, the field levels globally, um, we're, we're just going to have tighter, tougher competition uh, where we didn't, haven't had for the last 20 years. So that, that's the risk. I think U.S. soccer should be paying a lot of attention to that, figuring out what they can do on a youth level and not just rely on uh, our culture to develop them, develop the players. And, it, and the funny thing is, when you sit down and talk about this stuff, the, the irony is not lost on me because we could talk about the culture of soccer being great for women in this country, but it's it's bad for men. Um, so there's a, clearly a disconnect there and a lot of work that needs to be done by the Federation. Do you see, if there's no changes to this women's game, like you see with the men's game, where uh, the better leagues are, say, in Europe? Uh, yeah, I think, I just think the money that flows through, um, the big clubs in Europe that invest in women's soccer, they can sustain losses greater than owners can here in the United States. Um, and we benefit again from our culture of, of women's sports and 330 million people in this country. And, um, so we will always be competitive in women's soccer that they are young girls and my my daughter is five turning six soon and, and she she plays soccer and very soon she'll she'll identify her heroes um that culture will always exist so we i believe will always be a threat to win the the women's world cup or the women's olympic gold uh but it's going to be tougher and tougher year year over year as the rest of the world catches up Absolutely. And Eric, thank you for joining us on the show today. We know how we do it over here. We have a shameless plug. Go ahead and plug away where you can find your opinions and all that good stuff. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I'm on Twitter a lot, probably more than I should be, but um, <laughs> you can find me at Eric Stover NYC. Um, e R I K Stover NYC. Um, yeah, and don't write hateful things. There you go. Well, <laughs> Eric, you. It's, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. You always provide great insight and a, a different perspective on the game as you obviously are in NASL and you've been with the, the top division with MLS. So it's wonderful speaking with you. Thanks, guys. I enjoyed it. And it's always good to talk to an executive who has been at different aspects of the sport. He was 2010 MLS Executive of the Year at Red Bulls. Now he's with the Cosmos. Brings an insight that I don't think we're going to find elsewhere. No, I agree. And it gives us a perspective. And he's been around. He's been around, to be honest with you. I really was interested by the whole Rochester Rhinos thing. 
because it's so fascinating. I mean, a why? team that – Why? No, no, no. But why do you think that doesn't get more coverage? Why don't why are we talking in a national Because meeting? we don't because we don't we don't care, Stephen. I'll be honest with you. People don't care that the Rochester Rhinos won a nineteen ninety nine US Open Cup. You wanna know why they don't care? Because they have short term hist- uh, short term memory in terms of uh soccer in America. I mean what, we talk about the cosmos, people barely know who the cosmos are for some reason. No, yeah, no one globally them. they're huge. Globally they're huge, exactly. We don't go back we don't go back in history. And the rhinos are almost a beautiful cautionary tale of What's going to happen potentially if, let's say, a Sacramento or Cincinnati doesn't get that MLS bid? What's going to happen? You can't go up. Right now in the system, you cannot go up. So what's going to happen? Well, don't, Are you going to end up? But here's, here's, a, here's something that we need to note. He, we talked about infrastructure with Stover and how important uh, having the infrastructure of a soccer-specific stadium is to the sport. Let's not forget, USL has, has I guess, a law or a rule in place – that everybody must have a soccer specific stadium by 2020. That's 2 years away. Like yeah, there's no way. <laughs> well, there's no way. It'd be interesting to see what they do, but there's a mandate that you have to have a soccer specific stadium. You see Louisville right now in, in the works of building a stadium that's 10,000 where they have averaged about 9,000 fans. They're building a 10,000 stadium uh seat stadium and then they're hoping to get an MLS bid. And there's mm-hmm. expansion plans to that stadium to fit twenty thousand, and that's the route I think people need to look at. Uh, what it's like what Sac, uh, what San Antonio has done, and also what Louisville is going to do is that let's build one for ten thousand, and if there needs to be more, we'll expand and make sure you have room to expand. That is the right way to go about these things. I think these small, these smaller, in my opinion, I don't think promotion relegation would work. I just want – if there aren't as many soccer-specific stadiums. Well, you know what I mean? You have to have the stadiums before you can implement promotion relegation. Yeah, That's I agree. That's my viewpoint. You have and, to have and the infrastructure. I guess the reverse argument to that would be once you implement that – if you say you're going to implement that system, it gives teams more incentive to start building those stadiums. Well, that's so, I mean, the thing. That's a, you that's have, a whole, it's, yeah. yeah, it's a chicken-the-egg conversation, but the conversation should be like, okay, well, let's plan for promotion relegation in 12 years. Gives clubs the chance to, okay, well – if we don't get an MLS bid, we have the chance of going up. We're going to work on our academy. We're going to work on grassroots. And in five years, seven years' time, we're going to build a stadium that's going to fit 12, 15,000, and then we'll see what happens. I don't know. The problem is each market's different. And Yep, exactly. It's, it's so hard to tell. You know what? Good segue here. One great market with U.S. soccer is Kansas City. Kansas City. Oh, same time? Yes, I mean Kansas City. They used, does... to, they used to be a mess. Oh. If you think about it, they used to be awful. Even though their jerseys are kind of sick now, like nostalgically, they used to be a mess. The KC oh. Wizards, at Arrowhead, they're on the verge of being contracted. I'm sure it was between KC and Dallas, yeah. KC Dallas or my or Miami or Tampa Bay, and Miami Tampa Bay to get the axe, and Dallas and KC have become well. I guess KC model. is miles better than Dallas. Well, in terms of off, uh, I would say like on and uh, off the at, field, on and off the field. Casey's won a cup. They've won three U.S. Open Cups since 2012. They have a brand new facility, millions of dollars where the national team can train. It, it, it's it, Sporting Kansas City looks like a professional soccer club. FC Dallas looks like a mess sometimes. <laughs> no, it looks like it, it's it's high school. How they they treat their players sometimes or how they don't reach out to the community sporting kansas city has that feel i had the opportunity to sit down with matt beasler to talk about some of the issues uh with sporting kansas city off the field he talks about the fans we talked about the u.s men's national team and we talked about the upcoming seasons real fascinating says some great stuff take a listen me right now is Sporting Kansas City defender Matt Beasler. Matt, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? Doing great. Matt, season's coming up here very shortly. How are you feeling so far? Yeah, feeling good. It's it's uh, it's always a long off season, 
So uh, it's great to get get started. We're down in Arizona right now. Uh, got some new faces. Uh, but, yeah, at this point in the season, there's uh, a lot of excitement. Have you been able to walk through that new training facility y'all got? Yes, we have. We Before we left for Arizona, we spent – five or six days in Kansas city, uh, you know, getting some physicals done and a couple of days of training. And it's incredible. It is, uh, it's hard to put into words how nice it is. Matt, last season, y'all won the U S open cup, the club's third since 2012 posted one of the best defenses in the league, but fell short in the playoffs. What are your takeaways from that campaign into this season? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, difficult to to really compare season to season because no two seasons are the same and no two rosters are the same from from season to season and so you know just because we won the open cup last year doesn't doesn't mean anything just just because we had the top defense in the league doesn't mean uh, anything this season so everybody starts from a clean slate you know i think the the great thing about sporting is that we have a very defined style of play and so that that's not going to change uh you know there's there's certain roles and responsibilities that every player has uh in their in their position and so that's what we're working on right now we want to make sure everybody's on the same page uh, we want to make sure everybody understands the uh the style of play uh, that our team you know uh demands and and then we go from there and then it's uh it's just on us to to see how fast we can pick that up and how fast we can come together as a team. How are the new guys fitting into the squad? They're good. Yeah, they're good. You know, anytime you bring some new faces in, uh, it's always a challenge. Uh, especially, you know, like I said, we we have very um, demanding uh, roles and responsibilities, and so. Uh, you know, we have to get everybody on the same page as fast as possible. But so far, the new guys have been great. Uh, their attitudes have been awesome. You know, it, it, they all come from different situations and different parts of the world, and they all interpret the game a little bit differently. But, uh, you know, they've been very open to, you know, understanding the way that we want to play. And, um, you know, at times they've shown their quality too. I think that's one of the most exciting things of, of bringing in a new player is, is you get to see something new and you get to see somebody uh, with, with new talent that you've never seen before. And, and certainly, you know, the guys that we've brought in, uh, they've definitely added talent to our team. Now, Matt, when you have such a diverse squad like yours, how is the language barrier? Uh, it's, it's really not an issue. You know, we, uh, we, we have a very uh, connected locker room. Uh, which you know, I, I've only been in one locker room my entire career, so I can't speak for for anybody else. But we put a lot of emphasis on that. You know, we 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 put a lot of time into you know thinking about and developing our culture as a team. Uh, and and culture is an interesting topic because it's it's always changing. You know, it's always flowing up and down, and it's it's something that you you really have to work on and. You know, I think uh, we the, the credit has to be given to uh, you know some of the core veterans on the team that have been with the team for a while because uh, over a number of years I think we have had a very successful uh, and positive culture in our locker room and so it makes it easy when that culture is established for a new guy to come in because immediately from day one they're looking around and, and seeing what's going on and and they have to adjust to that. And so if, if, it, if the culture is already set, uh, you really don't have to work too hard on it. You know, the new guys, it's on them to adjust to it. And they're either going to kind of buy in or they're not. And if they don't, then they're going to be an outcast. And those people stick out, and those people usually don't uh, stick around for very long. How important is Peter Vermeens to your locker room in that culture? Yeah, I mean, Peter, it starts with him. You know, he's, he's at the top. Uh, and, and everything sort of trickles down from him. Uh, you know, it's it's a bit of his personality. He's uh, he's very Type A. Uh, he's demanding, uh, but he but he's also fair. I mean, he he knows what he wants and he has his vision. And then he's he's good at communicating that and and putting it into terms that we all can understand. And so, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Peter's done an excellent job uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and like I said, you know, the players have really, um, you know, grasped onto to some of his concepts and established that culture that we have. Do you have? Any, do you guys write down any expectations for the upcoming season? Yeah, I mean, we 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 go through a uh, kind of an introductory uh, presentation that Peter leads. Uh, we do that every year. We actually did, just did it a few days ago. Um, it introduces the the core values of the club. Uh, you know what's important. Um, you know I don't want to go through everything specifically, mm. uh, but you know one of them is, is team first. You know that's the that's the very first core value that we have. Uh, the team comes first. There's no exceptions. <clears throat> uh, nobody's above the team. Uh, there's not one or two individuals that, that make the team. It's, it's all team first. So, so there's about four or five uh, core values that we have. We then go through expectations of the team. Uh, we go through expectations of a player individually, both on and off the field. Uh, we go through uh, the styles of, of play that we expect, um, You know how things want to look defensively, how things want to look offensively what the expectations are on set pieces and so that's one of the things that peter does an excellent job uh he does it early on in preseason and so he sets the bar very high and he just he lays it all out there for for you to understand and you know he says look these are the expectations um they're they're pretty much black and white um we expect you to live up to these um and if you don't then you're not doing your job And you're not gonna you're not gonna be here for very long. And so, you know, I think uh, it's always interesting to see some of these new guys that come in that have never really experienced that before. You know, their their eyes get really big, and uh, they're they're a bit surprised with how he you know just lays it all out there. But um, he's honest, and so I think that's you know one of the best qualities you can have as a head coach. Absolutely. Now, Matt. The elephant is still in the room regarding the men's national team failure to qualify for the World Cup. How have you been dealing with it since mid-October? Well, I mean, there's, I don't think there's ever a way to, to really get past it 100%. It's, it's something that's always going to be with you, and, and that's you know going to be one of the most difficult things is you're always going to have to answer questions about it. You're always going to have to relive it and, and remember it and, and, and feel the, the pains that you felt that night. And, and that will, I don't think that will ever leave you. Uh, it certainly hasn't left me yet. Uh, you know, maybe in 20 years from now, but, um, but I don't think it ever will. So it's, uh, it's difficult, you know, it's, I could sit here and list off 20 different words, uh, and try and describe it, you know, embarrassing and terrible and, disappointing and, and all these different things and uh, I don't think that will do it justice to, to, to what what it really felt like um, it, it just it's a uh, it's it was a tough experience you know so the only the only thing you can do though is move forward and you know you you'd be doing yourself um, an injustice if you sat back and pouted and and you know were ashamed of yourself. Uh, and so you have to make sure you, you just move forward and, and you learn from it and it makes you stronger. And so, you know, starting a new season and, and getting back with, with your club team, uh, you know, that's one of the, the most positive things that you can do is because, you, you know, you look forward to another MLS season. And I will say, hopefully something good comes from this. You know, it, it, it sucks that you have to be one of the people involved. Um, in you know a, a major letdown like we had but uh i'm hoping and and i'm expecting a very good things to come out of this i think we are going to learn a lot about ourselves as as a uh, as a footballing nation mm. and i think there's changes that are going to be made because of what happened and and in the end i think it's going to be a very positive thing Now, Jeff Cameron, one of your colleagues in the back line for the national team, has made statements regarding Bruce Arena and Jurgen Klinsmann. Did you have a good relationship with both managers? Did I have a good relationship? Yeah, I did. I had a good relationship. Now, Cameron came out saying that with Jurgen Klinsmann, you guys would have qualified for the World Cup. Do you have any comments on that? Do you agree with them, disagree? 
no, I, I don't have any comments on that. I'm not, I'm not going to get involved in that stuff. You know, everybody has, has the right to voice their opinions. Um, but, but I'm, I'm not that, uh, type of guy to, to really be talking about it. Um, right now I, I really am. I'm focused on, on sporting Kansas city right now and in preseason. And then hopefully I get a, you know, get some more opportunities with the national team. But, um, like I kind of said, you know, there's, for me, I'm, I'm not really looking back. Now, Matt, you grew up in Kansas. You're a Kansas native. What's it like putting on the colors of the place or of the area that you grew up? You mean Kansas City? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's great. I I'm I'm very honored to to be playing here in Kansas City, and I have a lot of pride for my hometown. I always have. Uh, I, I think it's a it's an amazing place to grow up. Uh, I think it's a very underrated sports town. Uh, the people here in Kansas City love their sports teams, and they get behind us. And so, just just feel very lucky and and honored to to still be playing here. Do you feel like you guys have a, a an awesome home field advantage when you guys get to play in front of that blue hell? Oh, of course, of course. I mean, uh, our results speak for themselves we it's it's one of the toughest places for opposing teams to come in and play and uh you know the the fans have done an excellent job giving us that home field advantage one of the the best things about it is you know i think early on it was it was such a good advantage for us just because it was full every every game i think it's over 100 straight sellouts and it's really loud and uh that helped us but over the years it's sort of evolved and and our fans have have become extremely educated in the game and and educated about what it means to give give your team home field advantage and so that's been really cool to see because I've been with the club um ever since the new stadium opened and and now it's it's not just about being loud it's it's about understanding you know the game and the score and certain moments of the game where and the other team might, you know, have a long spell of possession, and, and the fans they 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 can sense that we need them, and and so that that part of it is there, and um, that's something that I'm really uh, happy to see, and I think everybody, you know, the Cauldron and the Blue Hell, and all the fans that come, they should be proud about that. Matt, lastly, here my assistant producer Jake is dying to know where the best barbecue joint is in Kansas City. Ooh, gosh, that's like. <laughs> that's like asking a parent like what their favorite kid is <laughs> when they have multiple children. I mean, right. it's it's tough. It uh, I really, I, I don't think I can give you one. I think it just depends on what you're in the mood for. You know, are you looking for a lunch spot? Are you looking for a sit down dinner? Are you looking for a, a date spot? Uh, there there's so many options that it, it really just depends on what you're in the mood for. Uh, you know, Joe's Kansas City is a big one. Uh, Jack Stack's a classic. Uh, so I'd probably go with either of those two. Well, Matt, we really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you play, and good luck. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No, Matt Beasler's a real nice guy, Armand. Nice guy to say pretty good player too in that back line brought Kansas City to one of the best offensive last season pretty big expectations with this club too I think Peter Vermees be- is, is a real good character um, and, and he really expects a lot out of his guys and, and he's demanding but I think I think that's what MLS needs demanding coaches no I agree and I'm excited to see how they implement their new signings such as AJ Oni Russell who they signed from Darby County um, into the team and how he fares uh, compared to uh, some of the other players that we've seen. I mean, if he p- fares pretty well, you could see him be like, hey, buddies, uh, America's pretty nice. Just have them come over. Because, I mean, we've seen the effect with uh, the players that have come in, especially like uh, Joseph Martinez, who uh, the Houston center back we just signed. I forgot his name off the top of my head. But he said Martinez played a key role in bringing him across. So, I mean, Hell, I mean, that'd be awesome, I think, if Russell plays well and he's like, hey, I really like it here. Well, I've, some I've, players come over. I've heard that argument more than once, if you're, especially if you're in the championship. You're playing, what, 46 matches, 
It is grueling. It is so pressure filled. You know, every match is literally life and death. Come to the MLS. It's a little more relaxed here. You're playing top division. You know, no, I'm serious. <laughs> no I'm relegation. Like, there's no relegation. I remember actually, I tried talking to Callum about this. He misunderstood my question a little bit. But that is one aspect of MLS that kind of look, you don't have relegation. MLS can really push this and promote it. I think it. they should. <laughs> At this point, I think they should. That's how I feel about it. But, Steven, got to talk to you, man. CONCAF Champions League is coming up. Yeah, very underrated. And it's the first time ever that I say an MLS side has could actually win this. All right, who's your who's your team that's going to win it? Uh, Colorado? <laughs> <laughs> actually... For some reason, I think Toronto is is obviously favored, but I can see Dallas somehow sneaking their way into this. They're made for this stuff, man. We've seen it. We saw it when they played Pachuca and pushed them to the edge. They were they're made for these kinds of events, and if they win, they'll be really likely to play uh, America, uh, Club America, which I think would be a fantastic matchup. But we did hear uh, Miguel Herrera say that he's going to rotate the side. Uh, against Saprissa. So, I mean, it's going to be interesting. If they don't make it out, I mean, then you have Dallas playing on our Costa Rican side, then we'll know what's going to happen from there. But I'm really intrigued because they're really pushing these Liga MX uh, MLS matchups this year. And you have Colorado playing Toronto. There's no surprise on who's coming out there. Uh, but Seattle and Red Bulls, I just... For some reason, I feel like Seattle is going to have a setback. I feel... After the last two seasons going deep into MLS Cup, I there's something off to me about that club right now that just doesn't seem a well-oiled machine like Toronto. I feel like Toronto has has signed players to be in this position so they could be the first MLS side to win CONCACAF and to really become a global club in the sense of competing at the FIFA Club World Cup. No, I know. I I agree, especially with the signings they've made, especially with the latest signings they're trying to make, the like Vanderweel coming over. I mean, and, and for it's a very just, cheap It's unbelievable. Price. For a very cheap price, it is unbelievable. I am genuinely excited to see them play, but they do have a big task. I mean, if they win, and if Tigres, who play above them, wins, man, that's a tough... That is a juicy quarterfinal matchup. Tigres versus Toronto? Are I'm you not, kidding? I don't like I don't like the fact that the matches or the matchups are on, on the bracket where you know who you're going to play. I, I you just, like that draw. You I love, love that draw. draw. I love the drama of the draw. I mean every matchup, every matchup in the quarter quarterfinals has the potential to be a Liga MX versus MLS team. For in the first matchup you have uh Chivas potentially playing Seattle. I mean this is all if they win out, I mean, there's always a chance of well, okay, one of so that teams losing. Besides, because you have Toronto playing Colorado, so it, it cancels out there. Obviously, you have an MLS side yeah. to go through. But out of the other three matchups, or do you lean MLS? Do you think this is the year where MLS could have four teams in the quarterfinals? They should. They should. And if they don't, it is kind of. I think it would be looked at as a setback. I think MLS is clearly the most, the second dominant team in. Uh, a second dominant league, excuse me, in Colin Calf behind Liga MX. I mean, looking at it, Chivas, Seattle, Red Bulls, Tijuana, Tigres, Toronto, Dallas, America. I mean, those are slated matchups. If Colorado were by themselves and playing in their team, I would have to go against Colorado in that instance. But over, I mean, overall, I mean, it does look like MLS will have four teams in the quarterfinal. My question isn't that. My question is who will be in the semifinals. What MLS team can beat the Liga MX team and move on? Because I'm really interested. If they can, I think the team, the teams that can, I think, are a Toronto and a Dallas. I mean, Red Bull, I, I don't know how they look like. They just signed Kaku, and I don't know how he's going to look like. See, I think we Red Bull seen them could play. be interesting because they pushed Toronto in the playoffs. Don't, don't forget, they were one of the few clubs that really pushed Toronto in the But playoffs. they don't have question, and we haven't seen them That's without true. question yet Fair and enough. with their new signing in. So I'm not sure. And Seattle, like you said, for some reason, Seattle, I just, I'm not, I'm not, they're a great team, don't get me wrong, but I'm not too impressed with what they've done signing wise recently. I feel like they I just mean, brought 
back what they brought, you know, had last year, and just said, okay, you know what, we're just gonna set up again and just do what. We I mean, do. what last season? Their 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 one their, their best signing had to be Svensson, right? Yes, Gustav Svensson was fantastic, right? And he was an underlooked signing, but he played really well. I mean, maybe we'll see a sign a, a player like that rise up. But I mean, I don't really see anyone making that big change for Seattle and Toronto. We've seen the improvements. I think they want to win this. They want to win this and go to the Club World Cup, as you said. In Dallas, Dallas, the way they play is made for this. Well, stuff. here's the thing: it, is I think from from you know, yes, we might have a little Dallas bias in us. Toronto is the clear cut like MLS side that's like we want this. For some reason, I feel like FC Dallas has put more stock into these games than any other MLS side or American based MLS side. I talked to Oscar Pereja uh, for an article in MLS and. If you want to go see it, go read it. I mean, I just didn't plug myself in there. But he says he 100 percent believes they can win it. He said he's like, no, we're in it to win it. We're not in it to go to the semifinal. Oh, good job. No, they're in it to win it. So they're gonna go guns blazing in these matches. And MLS has been accommodating with them. They have a bye in the second week. They might get some matches postponed so they can focus on the Champions League. MLS wants them to win a Champions League. So well, they have to because it's a great marketing point. Exactly. All these teams have a great chance. I mean, I'm excited to see this, and it starts Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So be on the lookout for his matchups. I don't know where they're going to be broadcasted uh, uh, in English. I'm assuming it's going to be Facebook again. Nothing has been mentioned. But um, as always, you can check Univision, and they'll yeah. probably have the matchups. And what's as well. another interesting dynamic is the fact that MLS clubs, these MLS sides, are playing such an important match. Without actually being in the season, the se- the season starts after they've played at least one important match. Yeah, but those teams should be ready, man. They should be ready. They, no, they should. And I, there's big expectations more than ever to do something. I don't think f- failure would be not having a side in the final. To me, that that's where MLS has to sit there and go. We have to have a side that gets to the final, not necessarily win it, but if they can get a side to get to the final and have two teams in the semis, that would be their dream. Oh, 100%. That'd be fun, too. <laughs> no, be Wouldn't it be fun? fun? But I would rather say a league MX MLS final. I think it'd be, it'd just be fun. So well, I'm excited to see what happens, man. Oh, it should be a great, a great few rounds. Yes. Listeners, remember next week, big, big announcement. Stay Huge. tuned for that. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Unc Sam Soccer Pod, Steven Jodder, and Amanka Fai. Assistant producer Jake Watroba. Thanks to our guests, Matt Beasler and Eric Stover. And we'll be back next week.